Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Hi, Shelly. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I laugh every time I do these. I just did it with, with Jen. And I don't know if I'm at the point where I'm old or if I'm just, I started <laughs> students young because everyone is now like in their in their their speed you know what i mean they're in their element and like they're coming on the podcast as like practitioners for four years and i'm like god dang i'm getting old <laughs> I'm getting i old. know i know it's fun it's kind of fun to be on this side of it <laughs> i know especially like when you and Aaliyah had coffee and texted me and i was like whoa that was a moment i was like i was like new Aaliyah, like Aaliyah just finished and you obviously were farther ahead and i was like we're getting to a point where like people are having coffee together and hanging yeah. out I'm like, this is weird <laughs> this is getting it weird. is I know. I felt like I could see myself in her three years ago. And so it was fun. It was fun to get coffee with her and hear how the residency was going and kind of talk yeah. through that. It was, yeah, I feel yeah. like it was a full circle moment for me at that point for too. That are, for those that are listening, I have no idea. I take doctoral students at Champion who were former like gymnasts or cheerleaders or whatever and teach them about gymnastics. And I've had 10 now. So Courtney, who's here now is my 10th. And Courtney was a gymnast I treated when she was a sophomore in high school. So I treated her for injuries and then she stayed with us and worked out, competed in college, went to PT school because a champion and is doing her last clinical rotation now. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely feeling weird. Not, not in a bad way, but just like, whoa, this is like a time, like a time warp. You know what I mean? Yeah, it really is. <laughs> um, but on that note, what are you, uh, what, what are you up to in your life? What's new and exciting? So yeah, the last year has been wild. Um, I'm still living in Birmingham and still love it. Um, Birmingham has been a really fun city for me. Um, so I've been here for a little over three years now. Mm. Um, but so I worked in a cheerleading gym over the past year and got some really ex great experience running a facility there. There's a CrossFit gym right next to it. So I got plugged in there. Cool. Um, and that's been really fun just like physically for myself, but also working with those athletes. But yeah. um, over the last few months, I um, got an opportunity to work at a facility called Godspeed. Um, which has been a really awesome, it's a big strength and conditioning facility here in Birmingham. They also have a location in, in Huntsville, um, mm -hmm. but they kind of got a fitness side where um, a lot of the coaches, um, they do all of the the programming in-house. It's for a general kind of active population. Cool. They do a lot of nutrition planning, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's been really fun to learn. Um, and then they also have kind of an athletic performance side where the coaches go out and train some of the like middle and high school teams um, around the, the area. Yeah. And then also we have a lot of teams that, I um, mean, athletes that will come for classes here. So it's really, it's middle high school athletes all the way up to pro teams. So it's been really fun kind of getting some experience with, with a lot of different teams um, and a lot of different, you know, types of athletes, but, um, yeah. and then we've got the therapy side. And so we've got three PTs here um, and uh, they, I kind of came in to build some of the um, female athlete programs. So I still work really closely with some of the gymnastics and cheerleading mm -hmm. gyms in the areas. I'll go out and do some injury screenings and things like that. Treat some patients. I'm um, kind of on site, but I'm primarily primarily based here um, in Birmingham. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm finding the more the more that I continue to shift grows and the network grows is that it's very it's hard to find. You know, we're rare ducks. People that like work with gymnasts or work with cheerleaders and work with whoever, but also have a strength and conditioning background, and then work in a facility that has all of the tools available, which is like a huge therapy side, but also has strength and conditioning. And so I feel like, you know, champion is, is just incredible, but I feel like it's, a, there's a lot fewer of those examples around where people can really understand these sports, like gymnastics, cheerleading and circus, I feel like in particular, are just like really murky waters for most medical providers. So yeah, that's, that's really cool to hear that you're, you're down South and having an opportunity for people who need it, right? Like there's a very few people who I feel like can really treat gymnasts and cheerleaders really, really well. Yeah, no, it really is. And honestly, I felt like I like, I saw that at champion and was able to like, you know, dip my toe into it a little yeah. bit at that point. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to go back. Like this is a dream facility where you truly can combine all of it, but you also have like really qualified strength and conditioning coaches right. who, you know, know their stuff really well and can also, you know, help me obviously like strength and conditioning is not my primary focus, but to be able to learn and incorporate those and collaborate yeah. with coaches has been huge. So I've loved it. Yeah. I'm finding very quickly that the best, uh, uh, either like OCS, SCS, or just regular PTs that I know are like, are relentlessly studying a lot of strength and conditioning. Like, I think I'm more of a strength coach these days sometimes than a, than a PT. Like, obviously you get the post-op stuff like that, but like half my schedule right now is just like coming and do like very quick hands-on stuff for 10 minutes. And then like, all right, let's just go work out. <laughs> you know, like that's an art and a science doing the medical side of how to dose somebody properly, you know? Yeah, no, it really is. And like, 
like in our facility, there's one other PT that I practice with um, here. But I mean, yeah, in the afternoons, I, I feel like if you were to walk in, you would think that it was a, a gym. You would think yeah. that it was, you know, everyone's just doing strength and conditioning because it looks like that. Like, you know, by the time you get to that point, like a lot of your your physical therapy is like progressing to the strength side. So like being able to like know and have experience there mm -hmm. too is is huge. Yeah. And, and this will kind of bleed into what we'll talk about later, but I feel like also, there's just so many people who get the like the the first stage of rehab done really, really well. And then either their insurance gets cut off or they have to like, you know, they're in a really busy clinic that doesn't even have ceilings that are more than five feet to do anything athletic at all. And they're just like, OK, well, you know, I guess I guess you're good. Like you can go back to gymnastics and they're cheerleading. And it's like, ah, uh, my back hurts a lot sometimes still, like when I do non human things, like just because I can roll over in bed and like pick my backpack up does not mean I'm ready and they get frustrated. Yeah. So. I'll, I'm seeing more and more people who are just like, yeah, like we, we just really weren't seeing great progress in a really busy outpatient clinic. And so can we come to you once every two weeks, once every month? And it works great because it's just like, yeah, let me just write you a program and, ha and help you find the right exercise. And you can do this on your own. And I think it works really well for them, you know? Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. And also like a lot of the gymnasts and cheerleaders have never been exposed to a weight room. So like mm. they don't necessarily have the gym right. to go to and you write them a program. They don't they, that doesn't really mean much to them, nor do they have the access to equipment. So mm. being able to be in a facility where we also have that um, is huge. And I find that a lot of the girls, like, they love it. They love it. They've never been exposed to it. And yeah. thankfully, some, you know, more of the gyms are are creating more opportunities for them to, you know, load a little bit earlier and have more weight in the gym. But yeah. overall, like, they don't really get that exposure. Yeah, that is by far one of my favorite things that Champion has helped me kind of develop is like, obviously, Champion is like a mecca for baseball and stuff like that so like people will come in and see like you know pro guys throwing bullpens and like they're high schoolers who are just like literally watch these people on tv right and they go to work out and that person is throwing a bullpen in front of them in a couple months so that it's such a cool um like parallel between like the high school kids looking up to the the college or the pro people and we're starting to get that with gymnastics and cheerleading too which is like girls will come in in high school for like rehab or for whatever but they'll see like literally the girls on espn who they watch you know like on sec or whatever like coming in for a console or doing whatever I'm like oh my god i can't believe that's that person right and they get to like hang out and work out with some of the people who are like their idols and i think that's just like so fun to have a casual environment like that it is it is it's fun and once you like once you expose them to that and once you like show them that hey they're just people like they're yeah. doing the exact same thing that you are i feel like it like gives you a different perspective on the things that you're going through too so yeah it's and it also is it, it's easier to convince someone to lift and, to, and spend off season season time when they know that those people are lifting at college and they're home lifting and stuff like that you know yeah oh 100 100 percent um, on the things that I think are most important. So gymnastics and cheerleading, uh, I feel as though it still has a unbelievable amount of issues with back, back problems. I think we're actually making progress. I actually, I'm more optimistic now that I was five years ago with information, but I feel as though when the, when gymnastics and or cheerleading comes up, people are just like, yeah, back problems all the time. And then the next logical conclusion from doctors around here or others, uh, not all, but just like, okay, well, the only reason you get back pain is because you bent backwards and you get a spiny fracture. And so that's it, you know, and it's like, that's a little more complicated than that. So that's what I wanted to kind of dive into is because I feel like there are some subcategories of back pain and there are some very helpful things that people should know about helping or treating those people or getting back. And so that's what I wanted to explore. So let's just start there. Let's um, let's maybe just outline the different subcategories that people could have with back pain and why they're not always just like back handsprings. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It is. I, I find that it's, I'm, I'm glad that we're seeing more and more awareness around what these injuries are and bondies and all of that but it is i feel like it's almost like gone to the opposite end of the spectrum where that's that's all we're seeing and then we're assuming that that's that's the primary thing yeah. um so kind of going yeah off of that i feel like um and you and i've talked about this a lot too but categorizing it in as movement patterns and mm -hmm. movements that we see is you know one way that we can kind of classify and you know break down different skills so like is it an extension? Is it bending backwards that hurts? Is it bending forward or going, you know, into a flex posture? Mm. Or is it strictly just like impacting? Is it both? Mm. Is it all mm. of them? Do you have a component of all of it? Um, but at least like as a, as a practitioner and like, you know, starting and working with someone and going through a subjective and like trying to get a baseline, like categorizing it as right. a little bit of like, okay, is it this, is it this? Um, and then now let's like, you know, put it all together um, is, is one way to do it. Um, so going into extension first because i know that this is something that is definitely it's it's more common um but the the facet injuries are those like joints between each vertebra so um, each spinal segment 
Um, you just, you have a lot of loading when you go into an extended position. So that's kind of one of the first areas that you can, you know, get that, that repetitive stress. Um, and I mean, that could be, you know, just a, an irritation and irritation of that like capsule around it mm. all the way up to your spondylolysis, your spondylolisthesis, the like full fractures um, and that like slippage forward. So that's, that's definitely the most common one and the one that you were um, just alluding to that people tend to kind of jump to. Um, and it can be a, you know, a wide range, you know, of kind of where someone is in that spectrum. Um, but it could also be, it could also be the ligaments of the spine. Like you've got a lot of ligaments that run through um, in the front, in the middle, in the back of the spine. And especially those ligaments that are in front of the spine, when you go into that like hyper extended and like really arched back position, um, those ligaments can be stressed. So that could be, you know, a source of pain. Mm. Um, something too, especially in your like really hyper mobile or you're like, your gymnasts that, you know, you look at them and they like pancake when they do a, a back yeah. bend or a back handspring. Um, a lot of times those spinous processes will abut against each other. Um, and so that can just be an area of pain. Um, and a lot of times that's like just tender to touch yep. um, more so than like, you know, if it's, if it's a little bit deeper, if it's, you know, it doesn't necessarily be as tender to touch, like you're not going to be able to like touch a, a segment and like touch the fracture. That's going to be much deeper. Now, granted, you can have some sensitivity around the area, but if you can like touch the pain and it's tender, like right over those spinous processes and their back, a lot of times it can be from that like hyperextended and them actually like bending and hitting each other. Sure. Um, so I would say that those are, those are probably the most common things that I see, at least with extension. Yep. Um, going more into like the impact or the compressive forces and then in that um, repetitive, like forward bending and forward flexion. So discogenic pain and the disc, like that takes a lot of pressure in that especially the compression area and so like the just doing the repetitive flexion um skills and um or like even like unexpected awkward landings things yeah. like that can can cause an irritation to the disc and cause that nerve irritation going down you have a lot more stretching to nerves too when you go into mm -hmm. that like repetitive flexion um and so i've seen a lot of like nerve related pain too as right. it relates to flexion and compression related injuries yep. um the end plates that are kind of in between you know it's it's sometimes hard and it's a little it's a little uncertain in literature like what exactly an end plate irritation can exactly you know present right. as um but that's just knowing that like the end plates in between which is um, those don't fully develop until really 20s and even into your 30s so yep. that can be an area that is just not fully developed and can cause some of that um, irritating structure as well. And then you can also just have the, the muscle and ligament injuries as well with flexion. Um, but just knowing that like, okay, there, there can be other things going on other than just that, um, just as assuming that it's, it's progressing to a spondy and it's like, okay, like it's not, okay. You either don't have a, a back fracture or you do like, there's a, a wide variety of things that you can have, um, to that. And that can be the irritating structure. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing too, over the last, like, two years that I have really kind of gone to is, you know, like we have to, we have to recognize that as a, as a healthcare provider, there are lots of different things that can be contributing to someone's pain. Mm. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be one specific thing. Now, granted, if you like had one awkward landing and like everything adds up to it being a spondy, we see it on MRI, see it on a bone scan, a CT, all of that. But like, there are lots of different things that could contribute to someone's pain. So like, Diving in and telling someone that is not always necessarily where I go as a yep. healthcare provider. Knowing that these structures can cause different patterns is going to affect how I progress and how I rehab them. Yep. Um, but that's not exactly something that I'm I'm sharing with them. That can be terrifying to hear yep. that there are a lot of different structures that can you know cause all of this pain and um, you know and I feel like that's something that you know as a whole as a healthcare provider we try to like dive in and find one specific cause when really it can be a number of different things. So taking mm -hmm. all of those into consideration and then, you know, putting it to get together to be able to, um, to create a rehab plan is, you know, is important to consider. Yeah. That's all fantastic stuff for a nice little overview. And I'll, I'll pull up uh, an article from Schiff's website that just kind of has like something, if you want more information than you ever wanted on back pain, um, this, this article has pretty much everything, but, um, so like you can kind of outline and see from the side, what, what Shelly's talking about here. So you have these discs that are kind of on top of bones. And then when you bend backwards, right, the joints that you're talking about are where these joints, for those that are looking, it's just a picture of a vertebrae, but you can essentially have these joints abut each other. And that's what we're talking about when you bend backwards. So back walkovers, back hands, 
springs. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's backwards, like back tucks or takeoff for layouts. You can just arch and you can combine and kind of irritate, you know, the, the joints or the ligaments that Shelly was talking about. And so generally you can have like issues on the back, but then if you bend forward, it's the opposite motion, right? Which is you're opening those joints up, but you're putting pressure on these discs. And then from the top, a disc essentially has a inner portion that can move backwards and can kind of irritate some of the muscles and the nerves back there. So that's kind of why it's so important. I feel like to have a really good subjective conversation with someone first. And for those that are listening, we probably have a variety of like parents and, or just everyday people who like have issues with back or like medical providers. And I feel as though sometimes we dive really hardcore into the, like the nitty gritty, uh, anatomy dorky stuff first before just asking like, well, what was the first thing that caused your pain? Because we're trying to just get people to understand like there's probably some things that are making your pain start and are triggering your pain which means that there's probably some other opposite motions that will make you feel better and we're trying to understand that so right so for someone who's thinking about that it's like okay we have like this spine and we have like extension forces which is like back walk over back handspring all that kind of stuff we have flexion forces which would be like rounding or landing like you're saying rounding in a really under under rotating position and then you have like straight compression which could be kind of like either and we'll talk about that later but just broadly those three categories you should be like all right does it hurt more with back bending does it hurt more with like rolling forward or does it hurt when i hit the ground and land and that kind of pulls you down it's like okay now that i know these are the motions that are probably sensitive i can then do an assessment and i can figure out which of these three is the provocative factor and the last step is which of these uh, opposite motions will make me feel better is that is that a good summary so far yeah that's 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 huge that's huge and like using you know your subjective to like really dive into like when and what they're exactly feeling on that to like get a pattern see if there's a pattern yeah, can can really help guide the next phase, you know, of, of helping to develop the plan. Yeah. And we just did an in-service on this actually for the students at Champion Now. And I think the other thing we can sometimes think about is, is oftentimes people are not really doing full gymnastics or cheerleading or circus once they have a lot of pain, but still their daily life will be a good like indicator of what things are worse or better. So you can just think about like, do I feel better when I sit and I'm in a car and when I'm rounding my back or do I feel better when I'm up and walking around, right? Because if you feel better when you sit in a rounded posture and you're flexed, like sitting in a car rider at school, you probably might have more of an extension based issue from backbending, right? Versus the opposite is people who have, who feel a lot better when they're up and walking around and they're laying on their stomach and they're like doing a press up or a seal press up an arch. Those are people who typically have provocative factors that involve rounding the opposite motion. So you can kind of reverse engineer what things make me not feel awesome and what things feel better. And that also gives you a little bit of a hint of what bucket or category you might be starting in, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, and then also just like encouraging movement, you know, encouraging mm, right. to, like to move through, you know, the things that, that feel good, that do make it better. Like we want to encourage people to move throughout it and not necessarily like go to that, like, okay, well, I'm, I'm afraid to move. Like right. that fear avoidance really early on really you know, can, can dictate a lot of their prognosis later. So like really, you know, using that as a piece to like, Hey, we can, we can move through that. Like it, it yeah. feels good to do that. So let's continue doing it and then progress from there. Yeah. And so I, I think it's pretty clear when I talk to people and when, when people try to understand it, like it makes sense that like, okay, backwards bending by itself can be like, you know, facet or pars or whatever, or spinous prosmen or just like muscular and, and soft tissue, but then also like rounding forward clearly can be discogenic. But I think that impact is where cheerleading and, and gymnastics gets a little murky because it, it kind of can fall into either category based on, you know, how they land and what their, what their go-to landing strategy is, but also like what kind of skills they're doing. If they're primarily back tumbling or doing dismounts versus if they're front tumbling, you're going to land probably differently on the spine so can you maybe share about how the impact category could either have a, a little bit of both on each side and how you got to tease that out yeah yeah 100 percent. so like cheerleading as a whole like your your skill variation so the skills that you're doing is much less like they're mainly they're learning round off back handspring some variation of a tuck layout full a standing handspring handspring to layout so handspring layouts fulls mm. um that's the majority maybe a whip thrown in there maybe an arabian like once you get to higher level tumbling but your skill variation is much less. So like you're going from back handsprings, which are especially like on a hard floor, which forces, you know, a lot more force through your spine, um, just being on something that's not as springy. Right. Um, and then like they're landing a lot more of a forward flex position. So like when you land in a lot more forward flex position and then with that impact on top of it, and then you're doing that over and over and over again. And then you're also, you're not really doing any other skills. So your landings are very, very similar every single time you do it. Yeah. It is. It's like that, that can, that compression and that like forward flexion is putting that stress on the same, same irritating structures. Whereas in gymnastics, you know, your, your skill variation, you, you're on four different events. You're learning a lot of different skills. You have to do 
you know, some forward tumbling versus and backwards tumbling or incorporate both. So um, yeah, you can, you can have like that extended landing um, Mm. or that like awkward landing that has that like big compressive and extended force versus that big, you know, compressed or flex force. So like it is, it like, it, it really depends on, you know, where, where's your chest when you're landing? Is it really far forward or is it really far backwards? Were you doing a vault where, you know, you're going forward and your momentum is going forward and then that's where the compressive force is. So like really trying to like tease that out can help, you know, just kind of help guide which one it could, which one it could be, or is it a combination of both? Yeah. And I think like a perfect example for people to kind of like chew on here is just like a basic run off back answering back tuck, right? Because there are all the elements that you would have possibly as triggering factors there. And what you can do is you can either look at film of somebody or you can ask them what part of this makes you sore. So if you, if the back handspring itself makes you sore, that's more of a, it's just a straight extension force versus if when you do a back tuck and you land, if you land under rotated and you're flexed forward and you're rounding your back, that's compression and flexion, right? Versus say somebody over rotates and they're actually very upright, they land with a big extended force on their back and now they're arched and they're landing in extension. So I think it's it's like that alone can be an indicator. It's hard for someone when they're tumbling fast to say like, okay, well, it's this exact moment that hurt the most. But then if you break those things out and you go, okay, well, how does a standing back handspring feel, right? Or do how does a standing back tuck feel when you land under rotated? Is that what causes your pain? Or when someone does a standing back tuck, they're very upright and you notice that they're like almost overextended or like a, a front tuck, like a front handspring, right? If you do a front handspring and you land under rotated that way, you're in an arched and compressed position. And the test that will quickly run through from the medical side mimic those postures, right? They mimic straight extension, they mimic rounding and flexing your back, or they mimic like arching and landing your back that way. And so like you can kind of do separate skills or have that person just kind of think about, okay, if I do a standing back handspring, it doesn't hurt. But when I land my back tuck, that really hurts quite a bit. That's a, that's a different category than, you know, just straight extension. Um, yeah, it is completely. And if you're not someone who's familiar with gymnastics and familiar with, you know, what all of this is and like, you know, being able to name a lot of different skills than like them watching it, have them, you know, pull up a video of something and watch the skill and okay, like try to decipher, you know, at what, at what part do you feel it? You know, once it's irritated, are you feeling it on all of them or, you know, trying to like really understand like the pattern. So like bars, if, you know, if it's more of a flexion or if you're thinking it's more of a flexion, you know, based injury or pain pattern, um, is it, is it more on your, you know, your, your glide kips or your yeah. cast a handstand from straddle or your stalders or toe shoots or, you know, things like that, where there's maybe not as much of a compressive force because you're not landing and going through it, but it's strictly right. just that like hyper, hyper flex or rounded back position. Yep. Um, and then if you, if you don't feel it on things like landings and things like, you know, jumping on a springboard or something like that, then yeah, you're, there may not be as much of a compressive or an impact portion of that. Um, right. and you'd go more after that flexion pattern. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so before we go on to talking about how to help somebody with pain, what are a few special tests or things that you're looking for when someone is in the clinic about, okay, you're in the extension category versus the flexion category versus the impact category. Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to do with everybody is just an active range of motion. And as basic as that sound, I think that that gives you a lot of, it gives you a lot of information on how they move and what, what their pain is. And if they don't have pain with excuse me, bending all the way forward or, or extending backwards, then giving them a little bit of compression to it. Um, now if they're super irritable, I'm not going to give them over pressure just to like, you know, increase that. But, um, if they're not painful with just that, like regular bending forward, then just giving them a little bit of overpressure into it just to see what that irritability is. Yeah. Um, or if they do have a pattern with one, um, I really like the test where you're like, you have them sitting on the side of the table mm-hmm. and they're holding on to the sides of the table. Up. Do you have a video or picture? I use this one all the time. Oh, it's good. It takes the legs out of it. Drew McGill. Yes. Drew McGill taught me that. So shout out to him. Yeah, it's a great one. Um, but yeah, just while you're pulling it up, so you're you're having the patient sit on the edge of the table. They're grabbing the bottoms of the table. They're doing that themselves, and they're pulling down. So it creates that compressive force. Um, and then you have them round forward, like they've, you know, I generally say round forward, like you've got really bad posture, and they immediately mm-hmm. go like this, and they push down and then same thing I want you to like extend backwards like you're trying to go into a back bend but you're not just bending your back and then pull down and see if that's you know a little bit more irritating or if one direction is more than the other um or if that really and more so reproduces the symptoms that they feel I feel like we mm-hmm. oftentimes like really jump to just saying like is that your pain oh that's your pain like well they may feel tightness or it may be a pinching that they feel so like using the same words to um that they use I think just helps like one, 
it helps them like feel like you're listening and it's not just like always associating like the symptoms that they have to a pain pattern like okay like okay the symptom that you feel like is that is does that reproduce what you feel when you're in gymnastics mm. um versus like okay do you feel pain because like it could be like that could be painful and for an 11 year old or 11 and 12 year old they have a hard time deciphering like what exactly it is that's painful i mean that's kind of irritating when i do it to myself it's kind of <laughs> irritating on me so like okay does that really reproduce like what you're feeling whenever you go into a back handspring yes okay now i'm gonna move forward yeah. um yeah, I'll show these real quick. Um, thanks for buying me time. Um, this is just like a, a screening uh, blog that I put up. And so uh, this is essentially like putting people through those types of motions. And so if you were worried that somebody had straight extension pain, you could do just a seal stretch, which you see on the picture here. This girl's just doing like literally like a yoga press up. And then you would have them actively move through this extension position and just see if that bugs their back because that's that's more of just straight extension versus if you're worried about like one-sided pain, you could do this prone on elbows rotation here, which would look like this one hand behind your back, just rotating side to side. That kind of just goes that way. And then over here, a standing version is like a stork test is pretty classic to kind of go arch and extended that way. And then the one that Shelly's talking about is this one, which is you sit on a block and you have somebody. So she talked about first rounding your posture this way versus extending your posture and pulling down using your hands this way. And so I think it's best done probably on a chair or a table, but you can essentially just have somebody sit and pull down. So she's going to have like this big uh, rounded posture. She'll pull down that's flexion plus compression <coughs> and then arch and then pull up this way. And so that's, that's kind of an easy way to screen out and test, you know, do you have more of the arch based, just straight back bending? or straight forward bending if you were just to touch your toes, but then also do you have like a, a compression and rounding versus compression extension. So yeah, not to steal your thunder, but I wanted to kind of give the visual for people. Yeah, no, 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 that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I think using using hop test too, like if you're thinking it's a mm. it's a compression based thing, mm -hmm. um, have someone jump, have someone jump on one leg versus the other. Like if it's yeah. a one-sided pain, like have someone do a single leg jump. Does it feel the same when you land on your right leg versus your left? Does that reproduce mm. what you know, the pain that you have? Um, I think that's another one that I, I clinically use a lot and use that to kind of test their irritability too, which will help guide kind of the next phase. Yeah. Super helpful. And so I think that makes sense. People probably get halfway through this episode. They're like, all right, it sounds good. Like I can understand this motion hurts and now what, you know, like a lot of people are looking for some, some guidance here. Maybe I think, I think the first place to start is, and I'll try to pull up some exercises too, from a lecture I did with Leah, but, um, like that initial, like two to four weeks is usually pretty murky for people. It's like a lot of things hurt. It's, it's really hard to, to really get out of that, that kind of initial oof phase. So what are you doing with someone say they come into you like, yeah, my back's been hurting for a couple of weeks and nothing seems to be working. And you do an assessment and you figure out like, it's one of these categories. Like, uh, what, what's the first thing on your mind to try to help them with? Yeah, I'm going to go to the opposite. So if it's a kind of what you alluded to earlier, like if it's, if everything hurts with extension and like laying on their stomach, even like they're going to go to bed and laying on their stomach, they're super irritable, like even just like being in a standing upright position, mm -hmm. I'm going to put them into, into some kind of a rounding, a flex position. Um, and now that's granted if they like, you know, aren't painful, I'm not going to push into the opposite sure. just to like force that. Um, but really just like encouraging movement. I'm going to go you know, laying on their back, I'm going to do a pelvic tilt into that like posterior, like tipping backwards so that you push that low back down to the, down to the mat. I'll do like a knee to chest, um, more so with extension. Now, if it's a flexion base, then, you know, going kind of similar positions that like anti-gravity position is, you know, is in general, less irritating for, um, for the back. If it's like super irritable, like, you know, super acute been going on for a week or two. Um, but that's like quadruped where you're like on your hands and knees doing like a cat camel, Going mm -hmm. to that, like more of an arch position, if I feel like flexion is more of, you know, the pain that they're feeling, um, doing like a, um, doing a rock back, doing, um, laying on their back and still doing the opposite. If it's a, if they're irritated into that, like rounding, then I'm going to do an arch. I'm going to go into, you know, something, lay on their stomach, do some deep breathing, um, deep breathing, you know, in general can have kind of lower some of that sensitivity yeah like i use i use a lot of those that thank you, know. you Leah, for these wonderful pictures <laughs> hello Leah. you want to hear a big l is that i did an entire course for a sports medicine athletic back pain and then i think i deleted the powerpoints but kept the slides oh no i was going to show the videos here but i literally think i deleted all the powerpoints so anyways <laughs> <laughs> that hurts <laughs> but yes this would be um this is for the acute phase so like she was saying if somebody has um, extension backwards bending hurts. We can put someone in hands and knees and do rock backs and kind of push their hips back or be against the wall and around. And then she was just saying, um, I couldn't pull the lecture up fast enough. If it's, <laughs> if it's rounding or forward based pain, 
going from cat camel kind of from a neutral position to an arch position and then laying on your stomach here and doing some belly breathing or doing some press ups here uh, is, is what you were saying, correct? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, I, I generally, even on like first session, like I try to find something that's not painful. I do something that's going to get their heart rate up, whether it's like using their arms, laying on their back, doing, you know, doing some arm exercises. Like I try to give them something to, you know, to really focus on, to get out of that pain pattern, yeah. give them the things that they can control that feel good to them that they can do at home so that they feel like they're in control of their pain so that they don't feel like, okay, I'm scared to do anything. I don't know what to do. Like do it consistently, do it frequently, you know, mm. really trying to like use these techniques frequently throughout the day um, is something that, one can help, you know, them again, just like, just feel like they're in control. It gives them a sense yeah. of empowerment and not like out of control. Like, I don't know what this is. I'm terrified. I feel like I'm right. causing damage the more that I do it. Um, so just finding those, like those things that are not painful and then, you know, having them do that really frequently, especially those first few weeks. For sure. Yeah. And I think that's why, again, some of the subjective stuff is so important because as you're talking with someone, you're, you're understanding, like, oh, this causes your pain. This makes it better. This makes it worse. Um, here's the reasons why you're in pain. And here are some exercises like this is simple stuff, cat, camel, breathing, whatever, just consistently doing 10 every few hours, you know, and like, okay, if it, if it really hurts to, to arch backwards, let's not lay on our stomach. Let's not wear a really heavy backpack around school. Let's try to carry our books or whatever, but giving them like, oh, I know why it hurts. I know what makes me feel better just that kind of psychological piece alone of like, oh, this makes me feel terrible. This makes me feel better. And I have exercise that I can do to alleviate some of my pain. And then to your point, which we'll talk about next, which is like just basic core exercises. They're not making someone stronger, but they're like giving them things they can do, which don't hurt. And they feel as though are keeping them active. Correct. Oh, a hundred percent. hundred percent. I also use a lot of isometrics during that phase. Yeah. like isometrics. I feel like we talk about it a lot in the shoulder um, yeah. from a rehab standpoint. We do it a lot with you know, with your rotator cuff, with um, shoulder injuries in general, but I feel like we could use that more in a, in the low back setting too. Like an, uh, mm -hmm. isometrics have a really big analgesic effect. So doing core isometrics, doing, you know, even like low back and um, glute squeezes and adductors yeah. and, you know, like all the things, hamstrings, like all of that surrounding the back um, can have an analgesic effect, you know, to yeah. help reduce some of that pain, especially acutely. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that honestly, for the first two weeks, probably when someone's in a lot of pain is convincing them that like, it, there's no red flags, you're going to be okay, this will get better. It sucks. It's going to take seven to 10 days to come and kind of put the fire out. But here's what's making you worse. Here's what's making you better. Here's some exercises mm -hmm. to do to just make you feel okay. And then here's some core stuff, or maybe we can still go for walks. Maybe we can still get in the pool. Maybe we can still get on a, on a, on a bike if we have extension based back pain and just do some light pedaling. You know, there's probably a lot of stuff they still can do. Here's all the upper body stuff that you can do in the gym. If they're not super acute, you can just still do body weight, lower body strengthening with split squats and step ups and stuff like that. Like there's probably a lot more on the table that you think you can do. If someone's really struggling that first week or two, you might be like, yeah, listen, like just try these for a week and then we'll come back in next week and we'll get to the round two. But in my experience, the majority of people are like somewhat ish able to tolerate a lot of stuff. And they like that. They like to kind of move, they like to sweat, they like to feel like they're doing something that just like lay there and wait to get better, you know? Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. And that's, you know, your, your nine-year-old with back pain all the way through to your, your 70 year old. And I feel like yeah. it, it gives someone like a sense of empowerment to be able to know that they can still do something. Um, and I feel like too, just with like, you know, where, where low back pain is going in general, I feel like it's our job as healthcare providers early on immediately to be that first person that says, Hey, there are some things that you can do. Mm. Um, you know, let's, let's set that stage early and, you know, not, focus on the things that you can't do at this point. Like, Hey, these are the things that we need to come back from um, that education point that literally starts from your subjective. Like my subjective is 75% um, yeah. in education. It's like 75% of that first session. And that's setting the tone for what their expectations are for themselves. Um, and just gives them that sense of like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I can still do some things. And then, you know, here's our plan going forward. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so let's kind of then move a little bit farther along. So say that person does, you know, has two weeks or three weeks, they're starting to feel better. Um, you know, they can move and they can function, but they still have yet to like really do any exercise mm -hmm. that's hard. Um, what is the next kind of intermediate phase here? Like what are the type of movements you're trying to get somebody back to um, before we start in like the plyo and running and stuff like that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to progress in my strength and conditioning. This is where as a, as a physical therapist, it's really important to, to understand those basic strength and conditioning foundations. I'm teaching just about everyone in this phase, um, some kind of a basic, yeah, the squat hinge, split pelvis. Um, a lot of these girls have never really taught or really know what it means to like 
use a hip hinge and to like really use their hips. So mm. um, I, I'm teaching every single person that comes in um, or just watching, watching them move and seeing if that's something that, you know, and that, that goes all the way up to, you know, and can, can progress into higher level movements, but um, I'm really backing it back to, you know, your foundations of strength and conditioning and the things that one are, are not going to be painful at that point, but really to help um, to, to build that, that strength and conditioning foundation to set that, you know, set that foundation for the next phase where we actually move into loaded extension and loaded flexion a little bit more. Yeah. And kind of what you're saying too, and I agree with it is that like, you know, you can, you can start something with body weight type stuff or very basic type stuff, and you might just need to play around with the forces. Right. And I think this is where a lot mm -hmm. of younger practitioners who are maybe a little nervous about athletic low back pain don't understand that strength conditioning is such a resource here because there are so many different ways to load somebody if you understand the basic movement patterns. And so what I have on screen for people is essentially, you know, the categories that we generally follow for the lower body are going to be squat, hinge, single leg, um, split pelvis, then accessory work. And then for the core, you're going to have like an anti-flexion an anti-extension an anti-side bending, anti-rotating, um, an anti-compression. And so you can essentially build a two-day program just like pulling from the menu of all the different exercises that you have available. And I think I want to give Dan a really big shout out here because this is something that he opened my eyes to, which is like different types of squats or different types of like movement patterns have a different amount of stress on the hip or the back versus the knee. So if you have someone who is not tolerating, say you want to do a squat with somebody, but they're not tolerating a goblet squat because it puts them a little bit too far forward and it makes their back feel sore. Well, you could easily do a, a very upright torso, just like almost like a sissy squat, but a straight vertical step down right on one leg versus you have somebody else who you want to deadlift with and they don't tolerate um, deadlifting or kettlebell deadlift that, that at all, you could just do a different exercise in the hinge category, like a single leg hip lift. <coughs> and it could easily do the same type of like glute hamstring loading, but you don't have that kind of like leaned over flexion vector. Maybe they just get to that later in the road. So like if you're a practitioner who really understands, you know, okay, here's like the middle point I'd like to get to, like goblet squat, kettlebell deadlift, um, split split squats and step ups we'll say if those things are not tolerated well what are some other options that are slightly easier or different that i can start with and then load them up higher and then eventually get to the fun stuff like the the goblet squats and all that kind of stuff you know what i mean yeah oh 100 those images from dan i think he he put those out a while ago but i know he like those are some of the best images for yeah. <laughs> like high stress low stress to the back um, he like broke down lots of different movements. I was actually having a conversation with one of our coaches here um, just for the fitness side. Like this is for, this is for our, for our gymnast. And even though she's never done any of those movements, you can still teach her those movements. Those movements are really important foundational movements that she's going to use all throughout gymnastics. And it's really important for them to learn. And probably 85% of the time they're not getting that anywhere else. Yeah. Um, exactly. if, you got, if you have someone that, you know, is able to incorporate that in the gym, that's awesome. But they also have, you know, 20 other girls that they're, they're trying to, you know, coach and correct form and also coach gymnastics and do all of that. So like you're one-on-one -on -one with a girl, like you're one-on-one -on -one with someone, like take this time to like really build those foundations. And again, like that's empowering them to be able to, to, focus on the things that they can do, maybe teach them something that they haven't. I found that most of them like love to learn something new. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like using all of those things and helping to build a program and then letting them do that in the gym mm. um, so that that gives them something to do, you know, while they, you know, may not necessarily be able to do all of their skills at this point. For sure. Yeah. And we'll kind of wrap it up here on this, this uh, photo for those that are listening and not um, watching. Um, essentially, this was what I summarized for the people that I taught the course to, which was like, you know, on the left, you have more hip dominant stuff, which might be a little bit more on the back as well versus on the middle, you have the mix kind of both and then the right is the knee dominant. So between just these exercises here, if you can get somebody back to like something on each of these categories, and then add like some core work in, it's a pretty good two day program, right. And so like the ideal maybe middle point would be like, a goblet squat for a, um, a squatting pattern. But if that is not tolerated well, you could go to a slant board squat, which would put a lot more stress on the knees and take pressure off the back. If you wanted to progress that, a box squat would be a lot more kind of hip and low back dominant. For a hinging category, if a kettlebell deadlift is what you'd like to do, but you can't, you can either move somebody to a trap bar deadlift, which is a much more vertical torso, or like I said, do a single leg weighted hip lift and then progress them eventually to a stiff legged RDL, which puts a lot more pressure on their back. For split squats, you could start with a split squat, but if that is maybe not doing so well, um, doing walking lunges tends to be a little bit more upright torso versus if you wanted to load someone's front thigh and hip more, a front foot elevated split squat. And then for uh, mixed stuff, so single leg squats to skater squats would be the knee version and then a high box step up to be a little more hip version. So you can kind of play around with, you know, all these ingredients here and make a two day program. 
And I think honestly, like for four weeks, I'm just literally loading people with basic mm -hmm. core and or movement patterns. Like, and maybe we'll move up the weight or maybe we'll switch to a sled push or a pull, whatever. But honestly, from like the six week mark to the 10 week mark, if someone has a pretty gnarly injury, it's like, let's just get you strong and load your core and get you confident back in the gym. And eventually you'll, you'll start to feel like you're getting somewhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this whenever I'm doing my lecture in the symposium, but yep. you know, like a lot of these girls have never heard of these movements that like <laughs> doesn't like as a practitioner, as a strength and conditioning coach, that means a lot to you. Yeah. Um, but like when you're actually like giving that to them, like build out their program and like have them read it out, have mm. them read it out and go through it and feel comfortable with it so that you can watch them do it. But they also like, they know and feel comfortable with it so that they don't get to the gym and then the coach and the athlete and the parents, you know, they're all looking at each other like, what was I supposed to do? Like, what, what is this split squat? What is yeah. this? Google, <laughs> what does Google this mean? Like, <laughs> Google Doc and YouTube links are a godsend. Yeah, you know? like <laughs> this bridge. Yeah, right. Like, this bridge is not the bridge that I thought. Like, I can't tell you how many times I put bridge on there and they like go up until like, <laughs> <and you're> like, <laughs> no! like not that one. Okay, the top is it. This is not what we're doing. <laughs> Um, but oh. just like having them do that in the clinic, like write that out, do it with them. Um, it gets them comfortable with it and then, you know, give that to them. And then you can, you know, focus on your, your therapy session or your strength and conditioning session to do the things that you were saying too. Yeah. Part of the reason I put so many YouTube videos up is because I needed them to make home programs. <laughs> so people yes. feel free to use all of the shift science, uh, shift movement science videos to like make your rehab programs. Now I have like templates in Google doc, which is like, all right, like drag this. You don't have to like copy paste yeah. every single YouTube video. Like I trust you, you're going to send you, you're going to save yourself a lot of time <laughs> by doing oh, it. Oh, 100%. Oh yeah. Your YouTube that has all of them on there and it's gold. <laughs> yeah, selfishly made that to, to help out uh, people and myself. So um, cool. And so I guess the last little category here is to so say now we're, I don't know, 10, 12 weeks in and someone's like, all right, I feel pretty good at school. I can sleep. I can do all that stuff. But like the fact of getting back to cheerleading or, or gymnastics is a little terrifying. So what, how do we introduce, um, like impact and or plyos or running or some of that stuff. And then we'll finish up with like getting back to the actual training side. Yeah. So one of the first things that I'm going to do is actually have them go into those what was initially painful. I want them to show me that they can do it in a static. I'm going to have them do those same special tests that we did initially. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know where their ir irritability is at, at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then slowly reintroduce it. I want them to, to feel like they can do it in a controlled setting. Obviously we can't do all of the skills that they would do, you know, at a practice in the clinic, but I want to reproduce as much of that as I possibly can. So mm -hmm. I'm going to reproduce. Yeah. I'm going to do a lot of the things that, um, that we initially did. I'm going to have them jump. Um, I'm going to have them, you know, go through some of those impacts, obviously to the point that we've done in therapy. Like if we've never jumped in therapy, I'm not going to have them do a hop test and then no get back to, to gymnastics. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not exactly what it is, but I'm going to have them. Yeah. Mimic that. Yeah. A lot of the things that, that you put on there are like yeah. are great movements that can, yeah, can give you a lot of information about kind of where they're at mentally and physically. Yep. And then cool. So how do we get back to the actual like uh power based stuff? So like the sprinting, the I'm thinking about like sprinting for vault and like really heavy impacts for uh, stunting or coming down from like a heavy tumbling pass. Like wh where do we go there to kind of bridge the gap? So I feel like in my opinion, a lot of people get actually get pretty far along to like the strength and conditioning phase, mm -hmm. but then the jump from, no pun intended, the jump from uh, <laughs> strength and conditioning with body weight and, and load and then going to like actually, you know, hitting the hard, extremely, hitting the floor yeah. extremely hard. It, it, that's where things like people go back too fast and they flare themselves up. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to use weights to mimic that as much as I can. I'm going to have them do a weighted, a weighted squat jump. I'm going to have them do, you know, a weighted or, you know, a box jump to different heights or, you know, a depth drop jumping down or a depth drop over to hurdles. I'm going to have them, um, you know, like a heavier load and, you know, do some like trap bar, you know, repetitive jumping hurdle jumps. Um, I love a sled push and pull sprints with that. Yep. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to mimic a lot of that, you know, as closely as we can in a clinic setting, um, just so that we can, yeah, we can like tangibly put, you know, and see how they respond to it. Yeah, for sure. And part of it is obviously on your side of the fence, you want to know, like from a structural sensitivity point of view that they can tolerate some of those really large ground reaction forces, right? So things that you said are great, like a seated dumbbell jump or a seat or a trap bar jump or a box jump to a depth drop. Like they're not exactly what's going on, but they also yeah. mimic um, a lot of those high forces. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of extrapolate that if somebody can do like a 30 inch depth drop to a stick, like they're probably going to be tolerating some of the things as well, but you just space that out a couple of days in between and make sure they wake up and they feel pretty good, you know, as well. Um, and the other one that I'll toss in too is, is to like a lot of med ball work is super helpful here too. Mm -hmm. is right. so like yeah. med ball slams, med ball throws. They don't 
perfectly mimic a back handspring or a back tuck or something like that, but they definitely put similar type forces on the spine. And I feel as though like giving that bridge to them of med ball ish type motions, like, Oh yeah, I kind of yeah. see how this is like a, a layout take off. And I feel more comfortable with, with that kind of stuff, you know? So you kind of get the impact type stuff and you get the rapid arching and hollowing of their spine. Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing too, I, I use a lot of like push press, a lot of overhead, yeah. you know, a lot of like walking lunges, like yeah. um, I'll use a bar and do a push press, especially I'll use this a lot with gymnasts, but a lot with, with cheerleaders and getting back into stunning and having sure. to hold weight overhead and hold it for a long period of time right. and hold it as yeah, a do different definitely. things. So um, I'll use a lot of overhead, a lot of overhead weight as well. Yeah. I feel like that just for the first time ever connecting me to like a really heavy push press is very similar to like stunting, right. And pushing someone up. So yeah. not only do you have to push press and brace yeah. your core and like learn how to properly squat, but also holding someone up there, like you have to really not dump into your low back. And it, that's a, that's a pretty gnarly extension compression force. It is. Yeah. I really use, I use like a, a clean and jerk cause it, it essentially mm. is the same movement. Um, I don't know if you're, you're super familiar with acro and tumbling, but I've, yeah, there's several acro and tumbling, you know, here and the, the movement pattern of them getting to a stunt and then pushing overhead is very similar to what you would need to do for, you know, the hip movement of a clean and then getting to a jerk. You need to be able to get weight over your head and utilize your body so that your arms aren't just like pushing it overhead. Um, so it teaches a really good movement pattern, um, without yet yeah, dumping into your low back and, um, yeah, just like teaching you how to use your legs to get weight over your head. Yeah, that's cool. I think I have a really cool video of, um, let me pull this up. I made this a long time ago when I was trying to teach um, like the basic 101 of why lifting is important for gymnasts. And I think this one shows, I'll, I'll show a push press too as well, but um, this is a really cool side-by-side -side example of, so people that are listening, it's the left is someone doing a Yurchenko and on the right is uh, somebody doing a, I think she does a clean and jerk maybe, but essentially slows down side-by-side -side and it pauses of the, like the triple extension yeah. the triple board versus triple. That's extension. awesome. I love that video. And then the impact of catching a, a power snatch overhead. Yep. I think there's, there, I don't know if there's push press in here. I could have just like, I'm going to eat my own dog food here, but uh, go dogs. Yeah. Hey, right. <laughs> yeah. The impact of an overhead um, that way. And then, yeah, I'll find a push press too as well, but essentially like a lot of the motions that people are training side by side is very much what can be mimicked on like the, oh, this is the one that like compression and impact as well. For like a one and oh, a half. Yeah, that's a great so, one. Um, yeah, and then it. let me find a push press. We can just stall for time here. Yeah, um, we. Um, well, I was going to say I was. I'm working, or I was working with an athlete. Um, she was. We were working on an ankle injury, but you know, stunning technique. She was. She previous history of gymnastics, and then she switched to cheer, and now she's um, going to be going to Oregon for acro and tumbling. Nice. But she is. Yeah, like she was having a really hard time getting it and getting the the flyer from like a hip and where a start position to, mm. um, to just like a prep position. And this is like one girl stunning one girl. Like this is not a, you know, a group yeah. of people. And so he, and we videoed her and broke it down. And really what it came down to is she needed to be able to use her hips. Yeah. So we worked on planes. Power clean. we worked yeah. planes. It literally was a power plane yeah. and it got better. And yeah, anyway, it was, it was a fun, it was fun realization to play around with that. That's amazing. For those that were wondering what a push press is, this is a dumbbell push press from uh, one of our girls working on the summer. So you kind of just see she yeah, dips awesome. into her hips and drives all the way ahead. But dumbbell push presses, I think, are, are criminally underrated for gymnasts. I, com I completely agree. And cheerleaders, now that I'm convinced that cheerleaders too. Yeah. Fun facts. Look at these are the things we learn. Um, right. Sweet. So yeah, that that I think that kind of is a good summary there. And I feel like, you know, the the actual getting back to skills and stuff is really just based on the equipment you have and what skills you have to get back to. And just like, honestly, going back through basics, right? Like start with just cartwheels and round offs and handstands and core conditioning. Yep. And if, if yep. you have access to a tumble track, that's amazing. I know a lot of people don't, but like starting on softer surfaces on tumble track, then going to rod, then going to floor, maybe over a couple of weeks. And just my recommendation would be just like, don't give yourself an open 30 minute window to do as many as you feel like you can. Like I'm doing 10, I'm doing 10 of these skills. And then I'm going to stop whether my back feels great or it's a little sore. I'm going to stop. And then three days later, two days later, I'll come back and I'll try some more. That's what I see the most people are like, yeah, gymnastics. <laughs> you know, they just go hard. Yep. Yep. I think too, um, bringing that realization back to like how many numbers they're doing. Like a lot of times, yeah, if you open it up and they're like, okay, well I do, I do beam for an hour. I do bars for 30 minutes. I do vault for 30 minutes. And I'm on floor for an hour. So you're going, you're not even thinking that's how you add up your one, two, three, 400 extensions all throughout one practice. So like yeah. bringing, bringing it back to their attention of, okay, let's do, let's do 10 to 15 and let's make them really good. And then when it makes you spend a little bit more time on it, it lowers your numbers and it just, um, it gives you more, 
um, intention into what exactly you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, it also helps educate the coaches to, to just right. more so just like bring realization to like how many numbers, like yeah. they, there's no way they can possibly count for everybody. So just like, okay, if this person like, you know, literally finished their 10 series and, you know, 15 minutes, the other, everybody else that goes for the remainder of the hour and is practicing that, like that's a lot of extensions that's adding up. So yeah. I feel like it's a good way to kind of, you know, judge based off of, you know, kind of where they're at and then ease back into it. Um, and yeah. it helps just, yeah, parent, athlete, coach, PT, everybody, um, strength and conditioning coach, everybody, you know, be on the same page. Yeah, I dig it. I think that's a really good little, like, just a little bit to start on and chew on. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to oh. melt people's head off with, with too much. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. And I think it's a good, nice little summary, but, um, so I, I think the time this episode comes out, it'll be definitely well known that symposiums happening and that you'll oh. be uh, speaking. And so, yeah, I think you're going to be on the medical day more so that a little bit more complex and a little bit in the weeds than we did today, but, um, it'll be for like PTs, AT. So can you share, I mean, I'm sure you haven't finished lecture, but, um, can you share mm -hmm. kind of like what the, what the main things you're going to try to chop through and help people with are? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely go into more depth of, you know, the specific with extension versus compression versus um, flexion, the different injuries and kind of, you know, subjectively and objectively, like how do you tease those out? And mm -hmm. um, like when you would tease it out and then where you would go from there, like objectively, like really, what does that look like for me? Um, yeah. And then how does that make me um, and help me develop a plan and moving forward? Um I'll definitely go into a little bit more too on, you know, the different phases, like acute kind of intermediate yeah. and then advanced strength and conditioning, what, what exactly I'm doing, how I'm building it, the numbers that I'm using. Um, I'll try to get as, as specific as I can. I feel like that's the one thing that's really helped me yeah. um, is, you know, try to try to get as much information as I can um, from previous lectures and to really learn from the people that could give me like tactical, you know, yeah. really um, tangible things that, you know, really help them. So I want to make it as specific as I can, um, into what I do kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. Sweet. That's awesome. Yeah. I think, I think that was the feedback from last year is people liked the combination of the, maybe like the overview, big picture stuff. But the reality is that the people that come to the symposium for that first day are practicing ATs and PTs and doctors and stuff who are like, okay, what do I do with the 30 minutes that I have with someone? And I'm, yeah, I love that we have a good balance there. Like the, cause I think the ph philosophical kind of big picture stuff is important. But when I go to a course, I'm like, yo, if I'm in the clinic looking over your shoulder, what exercises are you doing? What manual therapy stuff are you doing? Like, what do your progressions look like? And uh, yeah, I'm really excited for you to do that because I feel like that's still a really challenging thing for a lot of people to, yeah. to deal with is someone who like comes in with a stress reaction or a stress fracture or a discogenic pathology. And they're like, like, I, what do I, like, what do I do? You know, it's, it's intimidating for people that maybe aren't familiar with the sport. Yeah, no, hundred percent. It is. Fantastic. I cannot wait. Um, I cool. Shelley. Well, thank you for everything. Thank you for, uh, continuing. Thank you for having me. This is fun. I mean, truly like, full circle, weird moment. So. <laughs> this is weird. like so weird. <laughs> I remember you saying that you listened to the podcast before you applied for your clinical. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we've come full circle. Do you remember when I messaged you a year and a half before? And I was like, Hey, I just want to come learn. I don't know what I, do. I, I remember that. I, I remember that DM. You were like, yeah, I listened to the podcast and I'm like finishing my like rotation. Yep. School. And I was like, sure. Yeah. Why not? Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I have this one month and I just want to live in Boston and learn all the things. <laughs> yeah. And now you have a full, uh, you have a full, full moment of now you're, you're running in your own position at Godspeed. So, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's really cool. Really cool. Oh, Thank yeah. you. So I was, I was like the emoji up a little tear. Like, like, oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> <It's a moment. laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Uh, we're going to scoot, but thank you everyone for awesome. listening and we'll talk to you uh, soon in a couple months. Yeah. Shelly. Yes. All right. Sounds good. Thanks.